Hello. It's 3rd of April, 2015, and this is episode number one of the Unseen Podcast. My name is Paul Carr, your host and moderator for this evening. This is the unscripted, unedited, Creative Commons, open participation spinoff of the WOW Signal. If you want to know more about the WOW Signal, go to wowsignalpodcast.com. By open participation, we mean that you can be in the panel pool. If you want to be in the panel pool, email unseenpodcast at gmail.com, and I'll explain how you can be added. Go to unseenpodcast.com for more information. Tonight's special guest is Ben Tippett. Ben is probably best known to you as the host of the Titanium Physicists podcast, and he will be answering our questions tonight about the frontiers of modern physics. And now, I'd, first, I'd like to introduce our panel. Our panel. Let's start with Marsha. Marsha Barnhart. Marsha Barnhart, who is Marsha Barnhart? Well, I'm not a scientist, unfortunately, uh, but my background is in broadcast journalism. And I've recently retired as a broadcast production manager for a not for profit broadcast entity in Washington, D.C. I'm a proud Air Force veteran. I'm widely traveled, touched the soil of 27 different countries. And um, I have a degree in management and marketing, but my longtime interest has been in metaphysics and in studying questions surrounding the possibility of, for lack of a better term, interstellar speciation. So I'm currently uh, the chief of investigations for the Aerial Phenomenon Investigations team, and I live in Cadillac, Michigan. All right. Uh, Correct me if I mispronounce this. Chiro Villa. Who is Uh, Chiro Villa? (laughs) Actually, it's a villa. Villa. At, uh, yeah, that's the pronunciation. It sounds Spanish, but it's actually Italian. So yeah, my name is uh, Ciro Villa, and uh, I'm a technologist uh, and an application developer. And I've worked for a number of industries throughout my career. Um, I've always been interested in science and technology, uh, particular space exploration, astronomy, and cosmology, and uh, some other disciplines, many others. <laughs> Uh, I've been very active on Google Plus uh, for the last several years, and um, I do a lots of uh, space and science news sharing and outreach. Um, I've also uh, attended a number of NASA social events, uh, including um, a space shuttle launch, a number of SpaceX launches, and the uh, Orion test flight last year. Um, that's pretty much uh, the uh, sum, uh, the nutshell of my background. Um, my direct link. Uh, so my Google Plus profile is my name and first and last name together, chirovilla.com, and it points directly to my Google Plus profile, well, where people can find uh, can follow me or find out more about myself. That's about it. Great. Uh, Nick Nielsen. Who is Nick Nielsen? Well, I live in Portland, Oregon, and I write a couple of blogs, one on WordPress, one on Tumblr, where I primarily deal with the, uh, the structure and hopefully the future of civilization and its relation to big history and existential risk. I spoke at the 100 year starship symposia in 2011 and 2012. And I spoke at the Icarus interstellar starship Congress in 2013. And I contribute occasionally to Paul Gilster's Centauri dreams blogs, where I usually write about interstellar travel and the future of civilization. Great. Thanks, Nick. And and as you all know me, I'm Paul Carr. I'm the founder of the Wow Signal podcast and this podcast. And I live in suburban DC in Maryland. And uh, my day job is spacecraft systems engineering. So, uh, Ben, you teach at, uh, you teach physics at, I believe, the University of British Columbia or? Yeah, the UBC Okanagan. uh, The UBC. Uh, in is UBC is a famous Canadian university. It's got a big campus in Vancouver and a little satellite campus out in the middle of the interior of British Columbia, where we grow all the wine and the apples that everybody eats. So <laughs> that's where I teach. Right now, um, you've got. Let me add, before we start into the physics, I want to ask you about your podcast a little bit, Titanium sure. Physicist, which I I hardly ever miss an episode. I think it's 
really good podcast. Thank now, you. what inspired you? The, the way you do it is kind of interesting. You mix physicists, bona fide credential physicists with creative types. I mean, you've had Zach Wienersmith on your show. You've had uh, Ryan North, some other people that his names don't occur to me right now. Uh, yeah. What, 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 what inspired that kind of, uh, that mix of people? Uh, well, how should I put it? Uh, for, for one thing, I'm, I, I'm certain in a way that most physicists aren't, that there's an appetite for uh, hearing about advanced physics. I think what first clued me in was I was listening to like the Art Bell show back in the, I think the, the early 2000s was when I was listening to it on a podcast. And um, he'd have like Michu Kaku on to come and talk about space science or, or various other uh, scientists occasionally, you know, between various people talking about UFOs and, uh, and uh, you know, dragon monsters from the center of the earth, there would be the occasional scientist. And my impression was that everybody was really enthusiastic to hear it in this very broad community of people who tune in every night to listen to uh, things that are interesting. There's an appetite for people talking about science as well as more speculative things. Uh, and this is really surprising. Most people don't, most scientists don't think that there's an appetite for this kind of thing in the public. So there was that. Um, and then I wanted to demonstrate to everybody that, that everybody, uh, you know, uh, any person on the street can understand these advanced physics topics. Usually they're not explained in, um, you know, we take an, we take half an hour, 40 minutes to explain one very specific mechanism. Uh, like we just did an episode on lasers. Um, we take our time explaining these things because I, I have a firm belief that anybody can understand it if given enough time and all the background explanations. And usually when you see people coming on like the, 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 the Today Show or something to, you know, they'll have um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson on, he'll have five minutes to explain, you know, uh, how a black hole or how galactic <laughs> evolution works. And that's just not enough time. And so I'm like, well, you know, if, if it's working on like the Art Bell Show uh, where he gives the people enough time to talk, then anybody can understand it. So I like bringing in people who I know other people might recognize. We try to have a mix. Sometimes they're just fans of the show or friends of mine. Sometimes they're artists, uh, visual artists, musicians, comics creators, uh, comedians. Anybody I find really neat, I try to drag onto my show. And then um, essentially, I, you know, we'll teach them something. They'll be really interested because it's interesting stuff. And then we demonstrate to the audience not only how things work, but that anybody can understand it. This type of information, this type of understanding isn't beyond everybody, uh, the way the regular general public seems to think. I mean, everybody's like, hey, I can't do physics. No, you can. It just takes time. Right. So. Yeah. And um, it, by the way, folks, uh, we will have uh, links in the show notes to Ben's show. And uh, also, if you have questions for Ben, he has something called Question Barn. Yeah. Where where you can ask a question and they, and he and another physicist will sit down and give you a, a good answer. Good, thorough answer. Okay. Um, I have some questions for Ben, but does anybody else want to start? Uh, well, I, I kind of wanted to know if he could expound a little bit on some of the latest breakthroughs or understandings, um, bring people up to speed. Oh, well, I mean, how should I say there are uh, physics is a broad field. Um, people are exploring the, the smallest things as well as the, the largest, broadest uh, things in the universe. And we've entered an era of amazing discoveries just because people have spent my entire adult life building machines, putting them up into space that do that take in data um, and, for instance, how about, how about a sp specific example? Um, Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is a theory of gravity, it's it's essentially Einstein's masterpiece, this fantastic theory that he'll be remembered forever for making. Um, it predicts that two stars orbiting one another will release a type of radiation. Uh, it's called gravitational waves. It's, it's waves in space-time, little curvature ripples in space-time. Um, and uh, the United States and various other collaborating countries around the world have been building facilities, uh, big, essentially they're laser interferometers. They're 
long, long kilometers or miles long shooting lasers back and forth bouncing between mirrors that are there to detect these tiny, tiny little effects that gravitational waves will make as they pass through. And they're in the process of putting this thing online just, just right now. In, in two or three years, we're going to hear from them that they have made a detection of gravitational waves. We've, we've, de we've seen the existence of gravitational waves in a variety of other things. We can, we can see it doing astronomy, um, our, our precision uh, measurements of how various heavy things orbit other things tell us that gravitational waves are probably there, but we've never detected them specifically because doing so causes a tiny little, a, a ripple in space time is only gonna make things move apart, like a, a fraction of a, a proton's width, I think, over the course of several miles. But even then, we're on the verge of detecting it. Absolutely fantastic. Um, the, uh, uh, the, what's it called? The Large Hadron Collider is going back online soon. Who knows what that's gonna discover? Absolutely fantastic. We're on, and, and then we're in the middle of putting all sorts of really fantastic uh, space telescopes into space. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to summarize uh, all of the different fields that are absolutely bubbling with fantastic new discoveries and theories that are being changed and altered and modified because of what we're discovering these days. It's, an, it's, it's a golden era of, of physics. Now, ben, one, one thing that I wanted to ask you about, well, I wanted to ask you about the gravity waves, but I think you've already answered that question before I asked it. But uh, the, um, the Planck satellite and other satellites that measure very, very tiny ripples in the background radiation of the universe, some people think they've detected a, a, a cold spot in that, which is evidence for well, I don't know if it's evident what it's evidence for, but some people think it might be evidence for another universe. Is that is that even on your radar? Is that possible? Oh yeah, let's see. Um, I believe was it, it wasn't Roger Penrose. It was another group a few a year or so back announced that maybe they had seen this. The deal is that the um, Radiation, uh, electromagnetic radiation, not like Godzilla, Incredible Hulk making regular radiation, just like radio. They're not radio waves. They're um, <clears throat> uh, microwaves have, have been uh, moving through the universe since uh, the early, early days of the universe when everything was so hot that it was a plasma. So back then there was light shining, you know, the surface of the sun, really, really bright place. All that light uh, is still kind of kicking around and it's gotten redder and redder and redder as the universe evolved. And so one thing scientists are doing is we're using satellites like the Planck satellite to uh, measure the temperature in different spots of the sky. And when we first just started doing these measurements, it was an incredible confirmation of uh, the Big Bang explanation for the universe. Uh, the, the, uh, from, from this data, we could, uh, we could do, do this, all sorts of magnificent things about uh, the physics that were taking place the physical phenomena that were taking place back, you know, it was only a few hundred thousand years, I think, after uh, the Big Bang had occurred. Um, so, so what we've been doing since is we've been using these satellites. Every time a new instrument goes up to take another measurement, it's, uh, it's making more accurate measurements. And the more accurate they become, the more we can see uh, details of the early universe. So one of the things we could see in the last generation was we could see sound waves uh, that, that kind of existed as different temperature blobs in the, in the cosmic microwave background. So one very difficult thing uh, that people are doing is they're looking, they're trying to analyze uh, what the slightly different temperature variations here and there mean. Um, it's difficult to say whether or not you've got, you can say, yes, that is definitely a cold spot. It's definitely colder there than other places. And it's difficult to come up for a justification for why it is. Um, so you can, I mean, uh, I, th I think we heard an announcement a few years ago that some theorist group had predicted that a certain uh, pair of you know, cold spots on the opposite sides of the sky means that the early universe had bumped into another universe. And he, or uh, I heard another one, I think, that said something like, um, it's evidence of the universe that occurred before the Big Bang. It's uh, so there's various models of what happened in the very first second of the universe, and one of them is that the universe emerged from a singularity. Another one involves all of the matter in the universe being uh, collapsing, 
for all time, and then bouncing and starting uh, re-expanding and inflating. Um, and so I've heard another announcement saying that that various noise was indication that they saw um, it was it was uh, evidence that we'd seen uh, for the universe before the Big Bang occurred. So there's various people making announcements. I'm not sure if anybody's taking what they announced too seriously, but we, you know, we'll, we'll keep our ears open. If the next round of data is uh, much more conclusive on these things, we might have to rewrite the textbooks. But as far as things go, when somebody announces something like this, we just kind of nod and smile and say, well, next time we put up a better satellite, maybe uh, kind of like the face on Mars, right? Yeah. <laughs> You say, okay, well, maybe there's a face on Mars. I don't know. We'll we'll send up a better satellite. We'll send up a better spacecraft, and it'll take better photographs, and we'll see, right? Yeah, and it didn't look like a face, so. <laughs> <laughs> that was too bad. Yeah. Um, okay, anybody else have uh, another question for Ben? Yeah. Actually, uh, I have a question. Is it you? I have a question for uh, Brett regarding uh, kind of on the same line of what we were just talking about. Uh, and uh, I was kind of curious uh, – I know regarding the, uh, the you know there's there's different theories as he was mentioning regarding what the ultimate fate of the universe might be, and um, you know one of them is uh, the, uh, the the that the universe would kind of expand forever, right? Mm -hmm. Another one I think it's called the big rip, well, which kind of shred apart, and right. uh, we got the big crunch where we'll eventually stop and come back. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question is, uh, which one of these uh, different theories do you believe? Uh, being more plausible based on what you've been, uh, you know, studying and what you've been experiencing in your uh, academic uh, and otherwise, uh, you know, war work. Right. So, so uh, I, I feel like the theme of of what I what I keep talking about is that um, as as time as my adult life goes on, our our uh, our means of testing, our means of gaining data, become more and more accurate. The telescopes are getting better. Uh, we're sending up more. Everything's fantastic. We've got lots of great data. Um, and I think, so what we knew back in the early 20th century was that the universe was expanding, which was crazy. Everybody lost their stuff. You know, it was unforeseen. Everybody imagined that the universe was something that never really changed. Sure, life on Earth changed. Maybe the Earth formed at some point in time. But they imagined that the universe as a whole was an unchanging object. And then in the 20s, Hubble discovered that the universe was expanding. Einstein provided us a, with a theory explaining why the universe was expanding. It was very interesting. Nobody knew what the dynamics of that expansion were exactly. We knew some things about it, like that it was expanding. Uh, and then we could fit that information into the theory. And the theory would tell us it might expand and then recollapse, or it might expand forever. We weren't quite sure. Um, then comes along in the in the late 90s, uh, mid to late 90s, and then early 2000s, we started um, getting studying ex actually the uh, supernovas from really really far away, and also the uh, cosmic microwave background, and those told us more information about the dynamics of the universe. We got a better picture of what the history of the universe was, and from that we deduced not only is the universe expanding, that expansion is accelerating, which means a variety of things. Um, one of them is that it means that something is driving the acceleration. You've heard it called fant or dark energy, right? We're not sure what the nature of dark energy is. All we know is that it's causing expansion, uh, accelerating expansion. So because the universe is, we, 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 in, the, in, the, in the big crunch scenario where the universe expands and then begins to recollapse, what we would expect is that the universe wouldn't be accelerating in its expansion it would be expanding but decelerating slowing down and then we could say okay we're about to slow down stop recollapse fine so it looks like that's no longer in the cards we're not sure though whether the universe will keep expanding accelerating its expansion at the rate it's currently accelerating whether that acceleration will slow down over time or whether it will speed up and part of this is that we have no idea what's causing the acceleration we we give it a name quantum energy, and we can study things about it, but it won't be until more data comes in that we get a handle on how the acceleration of the universe is changing, if at all. So the picture where the acceleration speeds up, that's what causes that big rip you mentioned, where everything in the universe gets torn to pieces. A uh, fantastic, fantastic ending to the universe. If that doesn't happen, though, we might be in for a universe that just accelerates its expansion 
nobody gets ripped to shreds, but eventually everything's kind of lonely and cold and you get heat death. So that's um that's what we're waiting for. More data. More data will always put put our mind to rest. I have no doubt that within the next decade we'll have the answer to that question, at least to the next order. <clears throat> Very nice, thank you. Anybody else have another question? Because I have a ton of them. Well, relating what he's been saying to the end of cosmology thesis from Lawrence Krauss and uh, Scherer, um, uh, before we have uh, heat death, uh, we've got each of the local galactic clusters becoming completely isolated. And in Krauss and Scherer's version, there's no uh, no uh, way to even detect that there was more of a universe, whereas I believe Abraham Loeb has published a paper suggesting it might be possible through uh, uh, monitoring the gravitational waves of hypervelocity stars to to prove something. I'd like to get your um, uh, point of view on that, if you have one. Um, right. So if the universe keeps accelerating the way it has, Eventually, everything's going to fall behind. All the other galaxies that are farther away from us that aren't in our local group are going to fall behind something called um, a, a cosmological horizon. It's going to be the point where, in space, where something will need to be traveling faster than the speed of light for information to reach us. Nothing travels faster than the speed of light, so we're stuck never hearing about what happens in these other little pockets. Uh, that said, there'll still be some information lying around it's hard to say hmm hmm yeah i don't know because okay so uh, so information regarding everything that's fallen behind the cosmological horizon will still kind of be kicking around it'll get redder and redder and redder as time goes on until it's effectively undetectable how can you tell anything about the undetectable universe you can't shrug i don't know yeah i don't know <laughs> Depressing, I guess. Are you depressed by it? A little, uh, yeah. Not, nece <laughs> not necessarily. There'll still be a lot of interesting things in the local galactic cluster we can look at. Yeah, well, but, you but know. For, 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 a very for a very speculative question, if it became possible to build an Alcubierre drive or some variation on the theme, would uh, would we be able, would, would that barrier still hold or would we be able to cross beyond it? No, if we had an Alcubierre drive, we could go anywhere past the horizons. We could go hang out inside black holes. We could do whatever we want. Go back in time, hang out with Julius Caesar, anything we want with an Alcubierre drive. So there, so there are at least, I take it, two possibilities then, uh, tunneling through other universes if there are universes or an Alcubierre drive. Well, I mean, I'm not sure how, plan how, how old you plan on living. I don't intend on living past 100. So, I mean, most of these questions aren't really on my radar for personal experiences. I'm not ever worried about looking at the night sky and not seeing other galaxies. I don't know. What evidence is there of other uh, other universes? What evidence is there? Um, that's a good question. Uh, other we universes. We speculate, but yeah, that's right. It's it, there's a lot of. Um, I don't, well, I, I, it's probably, it's, it's I don't not, think there's any evidence. I, what's that? I don't think there's any evidence. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, aside, you know, aside you... from the evidence announced, that they saw some signal in the cosmic microwave background. For the most part, you have to, you have to qualify what you mean by other universes. There are different senses in which people talk about other universes yeah. or the multiverse. Um, some people talk about, uh, other universes in our multiverse as being different pockets of space that are just really, really far away from us beyond our cosmological horizon. Um, in those sense, there's no evidence of them because they're beyond our cosmological horizon. They're just too far away from us to ever receive information for them. And then also, uh, the universe is accelerating. There's, there's other models. It's, 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 I don't want to call it speculative physics, but, um, one thing that theoretical physicists like to do is they like to explore hypotheses. So they'll say, well, I hypothesize that there are five spatial dimensions and that we're stuck on a four dimension or a, well, three dimensional spatial sheet in those five dimensions. 
Um, can other things exist in the, in that thing? What will the consequences of other uh, universes existing in the book be? And they explore these. Um, is there any direct confirmation or any information that negates these theories? No, not yet. We are still working on detecting things, and maybe in the future we'll detect information that either negates the multiple spatial dimension hypotheses or not. We're not sure. Well, well in that same token, then, didn't yeah. essentially M theory kind of need a 10 or 11 dimensions in order mm -hmm. for it to, to come to fruition? It did. So, that, the only thing we think, so, so then we have kind of um, mathematics to inform us that there are other dimensions, but nothing really to inform us that there are other universe, uh, universes, really, well, yes? Even saying that, I mean, M-theory is still not predictive. We don't have any, uh, it hasn't made any predictions that could either negate or prove the existence of that mathematical infrastructure. It's still, um, it's still a hypothesis. As, as, as much as that hypothesis has been been put forward by some of the smartest people on the earth. It's still a hypothesis. Um, we are not sure, even in M theory, I believe, how those multiple dimensions would have to manifest themselves. The need for multiple dimensions comes from a need for the quantum physics to be self consistent. Um, and so, even there is an, inside that hypothesis is us saying, well, we think that quantum mechanics in higher dimensions works like this. And uh, and then, you know, it, it's 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 there. There is a little bit of hypothesis making and going down the road to see what's there mathematically behind this. Um, and there so, are alternative mathematical frameworks that have been proposed. That's right. So us. So uh, so there being a mathematical framework doesn't necessarily justify us being able to say, yes, there are definitely other dimensions. Even it just says that these really smart people are exploring the possibility that strings exist and therefore that other dimensions need to exist we're not quite sure to be to be very conservative about it we have no evidence um that multiple dimensions exist <clears throat> yeah uh, sorry that, that, that's my fault um ben i wanted uh th this brings it into mind uh, this discussion of all their universes uh one of the things that's hardest for me to wrap my head around which is cosmic inflation now, I I think there is at least a little bit of evidence for cosmic inflation, um, but uh, does that mean there are regions of the universe that are simply unreachable to us, but could the universe could be much, much bigger than we can observe? Uh, yeah. In fact, the um, so inflation is a prediction for the dynamics of the early universe that took place before um, before the cosmic microwave background was released. So it's an information, it's information about, uh, sorry, it's a guess about what was going on in the times before we can have any direct physical evidence. Um, inflation, uh, it is a theory that nobody's been disproved. A lot of cosmologists take it very seriously. Um, it, so, and it's been tuned to solve various problems in the, uh, they're they're kind of philosophical problems, and then uh, and then ex problems involving, you know, mixing. Um, you know, when you're trying to make a simulation for how the universe evolves, it's a it's a set of assumptions that uh, make the data fit our model better. Um, that said, w there's no direct evidence of it. We thought that there was direct evidence of it in the BICEP two experiment, which whose results came out last year. I'm not sure if you remember there was a, a yeah. lot of people being very excited about that right um what they saw was what they what what inflation predicted would be that um the rapid inflation of the universe would expand and uh make very large these waves these gravitational waves uh so they, they were originally supposed to be planck length the accelerating expansion of the universe, the exponential growth of the universe made those waves very large, and, and we could see their effect on the cosmic microwave background. They were supposed to make the cosmic microwave background swirl in a way. They were called B-modes. They're just kind of pinwheel-shaped swirls in the cosmic microwave background. The problem is that it looks like dust does that too. Right. And so when uh, on further analysis using other data sets, what we found is that we could not agree 
that what was causing these swirly shapes wasn't dust. So um, we're, we're not sure that all of them aren't made by gravitational... What we're sure of is that a good quantity of the swirly shapes that, that the BICEP2 project announced are no longer or weren't created by gravitational waves. So it can't be used as direct evidence that the inflationary uh, scenario took place. Uh, it's still the dominant paradigm in, in cosmology, though. Most cosmologists uh, like it. Right. And, so, and that, put, that, that means that the universe is much, much larger than, than we can observe? Well, sure. But I mean, in terms of classical uh, general relativity, which is the mathematical framework that the Big Bang takes place in, that our explanations of what happens in the Big Bang, that, that, that governs the expansion of the universe, um, insofar as the, the dominant paradigm, you know, uh, general relativity goes, the model goes, in general relativity, the universe was always, since moment one, infinitely large. Um, <clears throat> what inflation does is it says, well, you know, close at a climb to, close to the Big Bang, the little footprint that is our observable universe that generated our observable universe was tiny, tiny. Instead of just, you know, kind of big, kind of small, it was absolutely minuscule. You know, the size of a Planck length size. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, as, as far as these things go, the universe was always supposed to be infinitely large. So, oh, oh well, see, that's something that's kind of. That's another thing that's hard to wrap my head around. <laughs> uh, so the okay, well, maybe we'll just think about that for a while. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. But Marcia, I uh, find. Oh, sorry. Go. I'm sorry, Marsh. Uh, but we're just going to add. Uh, it it kind of reminds me of uh, of uh, you know one of these other concepts that, that I see a lot of people having problems with is the um, the concept of uh, that that there's no center of the universe. Um, right. I think that a lot of people, I, I found that a lot of people really have difficulties understanding that, um, that, you know, they, that their, their point of view is, well, you know, there, there was an initial, initial explosion, which really the Big Bang wasn't an explosion, right? It was an expansion. Yes. Rather. Right. Um, so they think, okay, so there's a, must be a, se- a center point, right? Mm-hmm. That's what I, I get. That's kind of the argument of, of those that are, have a certain amount of difficulties, and, and it's a, you know, of, of course, um, you know, we know that that's not the case because there's no center because every place is the center of the universe, right? Mm-hmm. But it, it seems to me, my bad, speaking of concepts that are hard to grasp for some of the of the of the uh, you know some of the people out there is uh you know the this one other one comes to mind the one about the center of the universe. So I didn't know if you want to add any more. To you know, regarding these particular ones. Oh, no, that's a, it's a very common misconception. Pretty much every episode on our podcast that we do uh, on uh, on cosmology, that's the first thing we talk about. Um, it's it's not... Right. It's it's a, describing the, universe, the, the Big Bang as an explosion that started off at, as, a, as a point, and then it exploded right. out, in which the uh, narrative that everybody hears. Nobody hears a physicist say, it started off infinitely large, it just had an infinite energy density, and then it expanded out and cooled. And people have problems with infinity, I mean, imagining it, it's a mathematical framework, so it's very easy to explain. Mathematically, you just look at it and you go, okay, that's very simple. But imagining it is a very difficult thing, and so nobody ever does it. So that whenever you see in a movie the Big Bang happening or anything, it always starts out as a little point. So it's a very common misconception, and uh, you know what? I don't what I always find, think, yep. What I find difficult is that you know, in in at the quantum mechanics level, uh, quantum physics, that observation. We're all talking about observation of mm. these things, and then you get to this odd little quirk, this conundrum that the mere act of observing could very likely change what you're looking at. So how do you get your hands around something that can that can play continuous tricks on the observer? Yeah, I mean, um, so the thing about quantum mechanics is that it's self-consistent. And, and it shouldn't be, it, it is, but it shouldn't be so uh, strange an idea that observing something changes it. I mean, if you were a blind person who wanted to examine a pool game that was ongoing, you would say, yes, 
The only way I can tell where the balls are is by stopping them. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, or changing yeah, I mean, the way they're interacting, right? Uh, it's just that uh, as far as things go, light doesn't apply all that much pressure, and most things are pretty heavy compared to how much pressure light puts on them. And so we can imagine that you can observe something without interacting with it, and that's not not true. And that said, you know, um, the quantum mechanics is really weird, but on the other hand, hey, we're getting quantum computing out of this. It's only a matter of time like we have already developed a few quantum computers um it's only a matter of time before people really start harnessing this technology and then it'll be a, t a total wonderful thing instead of a horrible thing this fact that uh quantum mechanics doesn't make up its mind until you poke it right yeah and then we can use that to do computations instead of just having to try to get our head around whether or not the cat is alive in the box <laughs> but just like our uh, knowledge of the universe is improving through better satellites and better science, mm -hmm. our knowledge of quantum theory is also improving. And there are some very interesting techniques going on. For example, the use of weak measurements to try to get around the uncertainty principle. And mm -hmm. I know some people are very uh, highly critical of weak measurements. And uh, some people are very enthusiastic about them, but it just shows some of the possibilities that might be pursued in the future for getting another perspective, perhaps. On quantum yeah, theory. it's my I mean, the, talking about practical quantum physics is pretty far out of my area of expertise specifically. Um, but I have to tell you that, you know, when I was younger, when I was an undergraduate, um, th the question of whether or not the cat was alive or dead in the box was like a riddle that that was posed to people that uh, you know you you can imagine that you needed to think your way around um and now that people are trying to harness this quantum weirdness to do computations it's kind of another thing it, it, entirely um it's no longer for some people the people who are working on this as a technology that needs to be harnessed it's no longer really something that's entirely speculative and weird and instead it's something that we can think about as you know, a natural phenomena that can be harnessed. Uh, it's, yeah, I mean, there's a, a, a shift in paradigm is about to, to come out where, you know, suddenly it's not horrible that the universe has quantum weirdness in it. No, but it does call into question how real the observable universe is. <laughs> well, as long as things are self-consistent, I think that's the most we can hope for. Oh, it's self-consistent in what logic? It's just as there are many mathematical frameworks, there are many logical frameworks. Mm -hmm. Many, many quantum theorists use a three-valued or uh, poly-valued logic, and some people try to develop the early in the stages used classical logic to develop it. And I'm sure there'll be further developments in this as as people get a more sophisticated framework in place. I know, isn't it great? <laughs> it is, and hopefully it'll also give us quantum entanglement transmitters so our isolated galactic clusters can communicate with each other after they have separated beyond the cosmic horizon. Well, isn't that, mm. isn't that impossible? No, seriously. I mean, you can't transmit information faster than speed of light even if it's entangled. Is well, it's right? not, if it's that, quantum entanglement, not it's not transmitted. That's not certain that you can't travel faster than the speed of light. I think that that is not certain. Well, we've never seen anything travel faster but, than the speed of light. But haven't there been tests that, uh, in fact, Paul, you just sent this thing up, I, I think it was Michu Kaku, about that there, I can't recall the test right now, but you can theoretically travel faster than the speed of light. That's, I mean, um, I, I don't want to speak to, uh, I, I don't want to speak to whether or not these things are possible or impossible because right now, you know, as speaking as a physicist, there's all sorts of people proposing all sorts of fun theories, and we're not sure which one of them is right or wrong when it comes to how quantum mechanics interacts with spacetime, or how, even how information moves faster than the speed. It may may or may not move through spacetime. Um, but let's think about it another way. Uh, let's suppose you could get, say, uh, um, things moving faster than spacetime, or uh, you could get uh, the type of fields we need to build an Alcubierre drive. But we know theoretically that those types of fields leave a very big radiation imprint 
on whatever they're doing. Like you can see if an Alcubierre drive is moving towards you and decelerates, you can see a path of radiation moving towards you. Um, How would that manifest? The galaxy, we can imagine the galaxy with its billions and billions and billions of hundreds of billions of stars as a, you know, a parallel computation on whether or not a civilization could build one of these. And we've never seen any, um, any of these radiation, these telltale radiation signatures that are out, that there are Alcubierre drives warping around. So it's not unreasonable to suppose that maybe these technologies aren't possible, just in terms of, you know, we've never seen the radiation signature from our galaxy or from any other galaxies. And there's billions and billions of, you know, a billion to the billion order planets with maybe life trying to struggle out of the pit and then once they just, life struggles out of the pit they struggle for intelligence and once they make intelligence maybe they try to build the warp drive and they fail nobody's done it so far as far as we can see in the universe so i don't know i wouldn't bet on it just for that reason not to say that it's not impossible just that i wouldn't bet on it. maybe they just can't get it funded <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's another possibility. They well, I'm thinking the... our scientists could be looking for X, and it could be manifesting itself as Y. And, um, you know, theoretically, we just aren't seeing it. Because if I, if I go into the, the woo-woo area here now, and why shan't I? Now you're sure. talking about things that are observed, that human beings are observing and reporting, that just simply do not fit the paradigm. And if you take, and I do, having looked into this, uh, if you take that there is a percentage, low but true percentage, of things that have been observed that do not fit our physics, correction, our understanding of physics, then um, you kind of got to think that stuff is happening that we're not seeing or understanding but is being observed so that is what i run my head around a lot how science would say okay this is being observed how could that possibly ha happen you know like as if something is popping in like our our universe is permeable to something it pops in you observe it it does something that you see and then it disappears something's causing that and we in physics right now don't have an answer for it, but I dare say something is interacting that we cannot explain in current physics. So what is that? Well, I mean, I don't want to say no just because, um, you know, I'm always open to the possibilities. But I think that the margins of the physical universe that are understood are a lot narrower than we give it credit for. Yeah. I mean, one could say, well, how do we know there aren't spacecraft? And go, well, I don't know. You're not getting bathed in radiation from spacecraft leaving the atmosphere all the time. And say, well, why don't they, what if there was a different field, one that wasn't electromagnetic that they could push off of, right? We see everything as electromagnetic waves. What if it's not interacting with the electromagnetic? I'm like, well, okay. Um, if there were other fields that we could, that this weird alien species could interact with, we would be interacting with those fields say at cern at a particle detector uh right because what you happens is you smash two particles together and the energy density at that point is so big that it excites particles that are just kind of quanta in other fields right and so you know that's essentially what the higgs boson was is that there's this higgs field that we're all kind of dragging our feet around in and then if you smash things together enough give it enough energy you get uh, an ex excited state in that field. You get, a, you get a particle in that state. And we really haven't interacted with any of, the, any of the fields, any of the forces that we don't expect there, that other than the four major ones. And I guess the Higgs field is now in there too. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's less room for these speculative fields to exist just because as we ramp up our detectors, as we make our telescopes better, we're not seeing all that many things that we can't explain in terms of things that we already know, things that we expected to see. And it's a little bit disheartening because I mean, I, I would love if UFOs could exist and, and that we're just pushing against a weird subspace Star Trek field or something like that. 
we're just not seeing very much evidence for it. That's not to say that, you know, they're about to tune up Hig, I mean, uh, CERN again. Um, it's not to say that they won't discover all sorts of weird fields tomorrow. And I won't, I'm, I'll be happy to eat my words then. Uh, but we haven't seen them yet. And I would expect that we would have seen them by now, given, uh, given what we've done so far. So it's like I said, I, I'm all for the unexpected, but the margins in which the unexpected can exist are getting smaller and smaller. Well, speaking of the Large Hadron Collider, yeah. uh, some people are talking about the possibility of microscopic black holes being generated sure. at the cool. LHC. Uh, how does that work? I mean, <laughs> and, and how would we even detect them? Yeah, so you, you asked me the earlier today, and I was like, oh, I better brush up. So I looked up the paper on it. Um, it's a tricky thing, but you can make uh, the, the equations describing a black hole in more. Right now, we live in space time, three spatial dimensions, one time dimension. And in, uh, in, when we talk about geometries of space times, four dimensional space times, one of the geometry types we can get is called a black hole. It's a sinky, holy, sucky thing. Spherical. We know all about it, but it's fantastic. Um, generalize that to higher dimensions and say, well, what if you get this shape? It's kind of like how if you, you, know, you draw a circle on a page and you go, well, what would this two-dimensional circle look like in three dimensions? And then you go, oh, it's a sphere, right? Et cetera. They're doing that to the geometry. Um, the, the, the geometry equations describing a black hole. And what they see is it takes less and less energy to make a black hole, the more dimensions you add to the system. And so they said, well, you know, string theory is positing. Uh, we, we spoke earlier about this, that you need at least 11 dimensions. We're not sure what's, how these dimensions are manifesting themselves. Are they big spatial dimensions like our dimension, you know, our three dimensions are? Is there a four-dimensional a spatial dimension L entity that can wiggle its arms in four dimensions? We, we don't know. Um, or it's possible, I suppose, mathematically. One of the theories that they're proposing is that the other dimensions, the, the ones we don't see, are compactified. Right? So they're just little, little dimensions. And we can't interact with them because we're too big to ride that train. Um, so we're not sure. But then what you do is, you, you know, you have your black hole equations and you say, hey, What's the energy threshold? What's the energy density threshold required to generate a black hole? Uh, and the more uh, the more dimensions there are, the smaller that threshold is. Until this last generation of CERN should have been big enough to make one of these black holes, if there were lots and lots of extra spatial dimensions that we're not interacting with, gravity would still interact with them, just not whatever we're made out of. Um, so that was the proposition. And so that was one of the things that we're looking for in CERN. Like I said before, they smash two protons together, uh, uh, and then you end up with a, a huge big black hole. Occasionally, what you would see is all that energy density goes in, it doesn't come out, and then there's something called black hole evaporation. Uh, Hawking radiation is the mechanism that generates it. This is one of the reasons everybody thinks Stephen Hawking's great i think he's great too by the way but yeah this is one of the reasons everybody thinks Stephen hawking is so great so um the idea is that a black hole the smaller it is uh the more it emits radiation and so for a tiny little black hole about that size what they would expect is it wouldn't last very long it would turn into a bath of other radiation so what they would have expected is occasionally when you smash two protons together just right signal would disappear and then way over here, you'd get a, a, suddenly a whole bunch of radiation would pop out into existence. And they would say, well, all that energy went into a black hole. That black hole did whatever it wanted. It wandered off. And then it popped into a whole bunch of radiation. And so that's what they were looking for. And they didn't see any uh, the last time CERN ran. So that's what that was about. Is that, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, so essentially, um... If there are a lot of extra dimensions, they should be able to make little black holes. At the, and if so, uh, would that be evidence for string theory, or is that just is that too too uh, strong a statement? Um, if it happened, yeah. If if, if it happened, uh, that would be it, it. Would certainly be evidence that the string theory community would, would be really happy to hear. Um, I don't think the fact that they didn't see it deters anyone. And I should also note that. Um, 
<laughs> what they did, essentially looking at the generalizations of, you know, like I said before, you draw a circle and you go, what's this going to look like in three dimensions? And you go, oh, it's a sphere. What's it going to look like in four dimensions? They were essentially doing that to the geometry of black holes. Um, but one thing that the classical general relativity community has known about for a while is if you have more than four spatial dimensions, you can get all sorts of weird black holey things that aren't black holes. You can get something called black Saturn, which is a black hole with a ring around it that you can get trapped inside. And then all sorts of other various black strings. It, it, past four dimensions, spatially, gravity does all sorts of crazy things. Four is a very special number of dimensions to be frustrating because in four dimensions, lots of things can't exist, but also quantum mechanics is really hard. If it's three dimensions, quantum, or two dimensions, quantum mechanics is super easy. Uh, you know, regular, you can quantize gravity. Three dimensions, I think you can still quantize gravity. Four dimensions, everything's horrible. Five dimensions, anything can happen. So, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to say. It seemed to me that the uh, the proposition seemed fair. I guess that it, that that you might detect these things, and they didn't detect any. That doesn't necessarily mean that other spatial dimensions don't exist. I think it was just kind of a a novelty. In the in the whole certain thing, there was no uh, people were kind of wonder, worried that it would, that it would fall to the center of the earth and eat the earth, but that was never really in the cards. Uh -huh. uh, the theory, as far as it goes, is that if one of these things was created, it would uh, it would be very unstable and it would pop out of existence pretty quick before it could get anything. Is is there a certain section of physics where somebody is working on trying to determine what the structure and characteristics are of other possible dimensions? Well, um, yes. Because you'd need so, that in order to do some of these experiments. You'd kind of need to understand what the structure is and the characteristics in order to be able to use them for equations. So who's working yeah. on trying to understand what they are? That's right. Yeah, there are string theorists who do it. Um, there are people who study classical general relativity who do it as well. Um, one of the fun models is called the randall syndrome brain world model where the universe is made of two, well, of just one. Our universe is seen as a, a brain, it's short for membrane, uh, a three spatial dimensional sheet in a broader bulk. And then what happens is as soon as you say that, you can do mathematics, uh, various consistency conditions, apply them, look at the consequences, try to do quantum mechanics in the broader thing. I wrote part of my on what gravitational waves around a five-dimensional black hole would look like if our universe is expanding. You can do all sorts of fun things about it. Yes, people are doing it. The real question we need to ask ourselves is, so what theory can do, insofar as that type of thing goes, is it can rule out some structure. It can say that some uh, multidimensional structures of space-time are inconsistent, that quantum mechanics doesn't work, things like that. Uh, what it can't do is... Uh, tell us whether or not a structure exists. It can only show us that there are mathematical in in inconsistencies in a structure. It's still an academic question. Well, it's not an academic question. It's a still qu it's a question that only experimental physics or observational astronomy can find an answer to as to whether or not these weirder things do exist. So if one of these weird black holes popped in, 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 in and out of existence in CERN, people would then take that result and run with it and look to see which, you know, bulk space dimensions were consistent with it, but it didn't happen. So everybody's just kind of shrugging their shoulders and still treating other fields as if they are, there's still exercises in mathematics and logic, which is fine, right? You don't want to put yeah. the cart ahead of the horse. Right. Yeah. No. Uh, well, uh, any more questions for Ben? I would be interested in uh, uh, asking about, uh, in relation to black holes, this uh, recent paper, Close is Safe, a Close approach to an accreting black hole, uh, which uh, Benjamin is a co-author. Um, on these closest non-terminal approaches, uh, is this close enough to the singularity to involve significant time dilation? Uh, okay, that's a good question. Yes. Um, so I wrote a paper which said, essentially, how should I put it? It's well known that just because you're outside there's, there's multiple horizons in, in, in black hole theory. There is the, uh, there's the place that light can't escape from, right? The place where gravity is so strong that light can't escape from it. That's called the apparent horizon. 
And then there's also the kind of point of no return. Um, it's kind of like asking yourself the question, you know, imagine there's a great big icy cliff, you know, an iceberg cliff outside your house. How close to the edge of that can you go before falling off? And you might say, well, I can go past this point, but if it's past there, I'll slide off. You don't know that the whole cliff face isn't going to slide off under your feet, right? So you might think that you're safe. You might think that you're outside the apparent horizon, but you still might be doomed. So what I was trying to explore in that particular paper was how close to the apparent horizon can you get if the if you know that a bunch of matter is going to come in, fall in behind you and make the black hole larger. Uh, so in these scenarios, you might be doomed anyway, even if you think you're outside the black hole, matter might be come in, coming in behind you and the apparent horizon will jump out past you faster than the speed of light because it's a geometric quality rather than information moving anyway. So um, wait, I spent the whole time describing the paper. What was your question? It was, oh, yeah. can you get close to the singularity? No, you can't get close to the singularity. Um, as long as you're outside the black hole, the singularity is still invisible to you. That said, you can get close enough to it where, um, where time dilation will still be a big thing. Heck, you know, time dilation happens on Earth. Uh, you, you're familiar with the, uh, the uh, GPS satellites, right? They need to add time dilation corrections to the fact that we're closer to the center of Earth the satellites up there but you yeah, need yeah. extremely accurate clocks to do that so my yeah, question right. is are yeah. you talk are we talking about macroscopic time dilation that if one person was on a satellite outside and another person took this closest non-terminal approach and they came back would there be a noticeable difference in their ages oh um yeah uh that's a good question we can Yes, you can actually get pretty close to the apparent horizon if you do it far enough back in history before. It's, it's kind of like the question of, you know, you're on an iceberg. Is the ice shelf going to collapse under your feet or not? If you get there early enough, you're pretty safe. But if you get there too late, then no amount of climbing is. That's a bad picture. I'm sorry. I'm painting you a bad picture. Um, <clears throat> moral of the story is, uh, yes. Yeah, in this case, you can get pretty close to it. And still get big, um, big, big macroscopic, you know, interstellar movie level time dilation. Sure. Ah, uh, speaking of interstellar, actually, I do have a quick question uh, that I, I kind of, uh, I was hoping to be able to ask. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie. I'm assuming sure. you have. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about the um, the representation of the of the uh, the physic the manifestation of the physics at at the center of the black hole in, in the oh. movie? The Tesseract. Do you think that it's pretty accurate, the way that was portrayed in the movie? Yeah, my interpretation of what happened was um, that he didn't go to the center of the black hole. If he went to the center of the black hole, he would die. Everything will die in the center of a black hole. Um, what happened, spoilers. Okay, spoiler warning. Okay, I'm now. Taking my earphones off. <laughs> so what happened was he fell through the event horizon of the black hole and then the future humans who have the ability to they have essentially have uh, faster than light travel they plucked them out of the black hole because they have faster than light travel they can move backwards in time they allowed him to interact with his past self using the faster than light technology I guess they're moving through the bulk in this case um, but what he saw wasn't the center of the black hole. The robot got sent to the center of the black hole, and the robot reported back to his daughter. But he, the whole room full of, uh, you know, the dusty right. behind-the-scenes bookshelf library yes. scene, the Tesseract scene, that wasn't yes. the center of the black hole. In the interpretation of the movie that I was, in my interpretation of the movie, it was instead... Essentially, he was interacting with the world lines of things. He was seeing the world as four-dimensional. He was seeing the, the time dimension as a spatial dimension. Um, but he was still very much not inside the black hole. So right. that was, it was a little bit speculative, but it was wonderful. I mean, this is, right. this is what we try to imagine uh, in part when we're doing this type of physics. We say, what does the world look like four-dimensionally? It looks, nothing looks like particles. Everything looks like long unstrings and you and i aren't sitting here we're actually vast tapestries in space-time that are just particles interweaving in each other 
for a brief period. Interesting. Well, I have lots of more questions, but I think we can go on for a couple of hours. But uh, anybody else? I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? Hmm. <clears throat> Let me try something. Can you hear me now? I hear you fine, Paul. Okay. So, I don't know who else does. Talked and talked too much it. about black holes. Yes. Hmm. I can hear you. Yeah, it's, it's been an hour 11 now. Yeah, it's been gone. Yeah, it's been an hour. Well, I, I don't want anybody to, if you have a burning question, I don't want you to miss yeah. a chance. But no, like, I, like I said, uh, Ben does have something called Question Barn. You can submit a question okay, that way. Back. And uh, every once in a while, he will uh, get together with the physicist buddy and answer the question in a short episode. So, uh, the uh, and I'll, again, we'll have links to that in the show notes. Uh, so, I think maybe what we'll do is uh, we'll wrap up here. And uh, I'll turn my camera on so Ben can see me. Um, the uh, and I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Ben Tippett. Thank and, you. I had lots of fun. Yeah, and, and I encourage everybody to go uh, go and uh, listen to his podcast, Titanium Physicists. And uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to try to get this right. Chiro Villa, uh, Marcia, perfect. Marsha Barnhart and Nick Nielsen. Uh, the same panel on the next episode. They will have a different panel. Uh, you still have me to put up with, but, um, and next week is going to be, um, Hiroja Shaib talking about cryptocurrency should be interesting. So, uh, thank you everybody. Um, this has been episode one of the wow signal podcast. I'm not sorry, not the wow signal podcast, the unseen podcast. Uh, and, uh, it's, um, Let's see what else did I want to make sure you you guys um make sure you go to unseenpodcast.com for show notes and we'll see you one week from today with episode two. Thanks everybody. Good night. Thanks for the invitation. Bye bye. Been nice interacting in the ether. Bye bye. Bye bye everybody. Remember to keep science in your heart. I will. Bye-bye.